sulfur bacteria. For those of you who know, salt marshes are bathed with seawater, which has a lot of sulfur in it, has sulfate. And so sulfur bacteria we find are concentrated inside the roots of Spartina. And we, we think that these uh, bacteria help to detoxify the root zone, remove, removing sulfide, for example, and then also help the plant to fix carbon and nitrogen. And so that's the, the science part of my presentation. And here you can see the, the uh, publications that we have that have come out of this research. This is for a Sea Grant project that ended last year. Uh, and so uh, what I wanted to highlight here in my few minutes that I have is you know, I very much believe in this multi-pronged approach of Sea Grant, and that is not only research, but extension, education, and outreach. And so this gives me a chance to thank uh, uh, Ann Lindsay and her team for partnering with us. We developed an interactive, uh, interactive activity for the Atlanta Science Festival called Marsh Madness. We weren't able to deploy that activity because of COVID, uh, but we will try again uh, soon. Um, so I thank them for their partnership in that. We've been involved in the Coastal Guardians uh, summer camp activity at UGA Marine Extension. Um, we'd like to continue with that. I was involved with the brown bag. Um, also, when I started this work, uh, Mona and Mark suggested that I partner with the LTER in Sapelo, and we have done that. We go to the LTER meetings every year. And uh, in education and outreach, we have, uh, so th thanks, Merrill Alber for that. And, and also we have partnered with the LTER to do their Georgia Coastal Ecosystem Schoolyard Program, where we train teachers uh, about our research and about salt marsh ecology. Uh, so I just wanted to mention some of those uh, outreach activities and, and extension activities. And lastly, I just wanted to finish by where we're going with this research and what impact we think that we can have. Um, and that is we wanna partner with the Living Shorelines Working Group uh, some members of that working group, Jan McKinnon, talked uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, to develop best practices for uh, restoration of coastal ecosystems and shoreline stabilization. And where microbes can help is what I call probiotics for Spartina. Um, and that is developing my microbial inocula that when we plant a marsh can help those plants uh, colonize and be successful. And, uh, and also there are known diseases that attack Spartina. And so um, uh, we want to identify these diseases and understand how they couple with environmental stressors to impact uh, shoreline stabilization and restoration. And then lastly, uh, Heather Josting mentioned uh, earlier today about our work on the sourcing and propagation of Spartina for restoration. And our part of that research is, uh, is identifying microbial diseases as we talk to nurseries they say they're having problems with uh, diseases that attack Spartina when they propagate them. Uh, and uh, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Costa. Um, we'll move on along to uh, Dr. Amanda Spivak. Stop share. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Um. Thanks Mona and Kimberly and, and Luke for organizing this. And um, it's been really interesting learning about all the different projects and people who are involved and um, in work along our coast. So my lab group is really focused on understanding the processes of carbon storage and vertical accretion rates in salt marshes. And we're focused on these processes because they support valuable ecosystem services. So marshes are really well known for pulling carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and putting it into soils for hundreds to even thousands of years. And um, they also provide a buffer for coastal communities from damage from storms and rising sea levels. And so these processes are really intertwined. Um, so the way that marshes build vertical accretion is that they trap particles that are coming in from the tides and they deposit those on the marsh surface. And um, biomass from the plants is, is buried in the, in the soils for long periods of time. So they have really efficient burial processes. Um, and so we know that we're living in a changing world and we're really interested in how disturbances, both natural and anthropogenic affect these processes of carbon storage and vertical accretion. And so we have two projects. Um, the first is looking at tidal channel migration and that's supported by Georgia Sea Grant. And the other is looking at sea level rise, and that's supported by Georgia DNR through a CIG um, award. And so tidal channel migration is a really interesting process in which one edge of a tidal channel is eroding and the opposite bank 
is prorating. And this process can occur over meters per year. So it's really rapid and it's occurring all along the Georgia coast. And so we're looking at this sort of through two lenses. So on one level, we wanna know how tidal channel migration affects the net area of salt marsh in, along the Georgia coast. So does tidal channel migration result in no net change in marsh area or is there a net loss or a net gain? And the other way that we're looking at tidal channel migration is how it affects carbon storage in the marsh. And so when you have an eroding creek bank, what happens is all of that carbon is literally unearthed and pulled up into the water column and exposed to oxygen, exposed to light, and then it's dumped maybe somewhere else. And so we wanna know how this big disturbance affects how much carbon um, gets buried in the rates of that burial. And then this project is a very applied aspect. And so what we're looking at is whether there are hot spots of channel migration and whether those coincide with built infrastructure. And this can also inform where we might place um, green infrastructure like living coastlines. Um, and so giving insight into potentially the, the long-term costs of maintaining current infrastructure and maybe the future success of infrastructure that's being planned. And like I mentioned, our other project is looking at the effects of sea level rise. And so sea level rise um, along this sort of estuary river continuum has two main effects. It's bringing salt water into areas where it may not have seen salt water before. And it's also increasing the, the frequency and duration and depth that um, plants are underwater. And so we're looking at both of those disturbances along the Satilla River, and we're targeting areas where we've seen um, documented evidence of shifts in plant community composition. And so we're using these shifts in plant community composition um, uh, as, as, as indicators to study the soil carbon processes. And so we're looking at whether we see um, signals of sea level rise and shifts in plant communities in the soils. So in terms of the composition and the amount of carbon that's stored, and also in terms of um, the rates that the marshes are keeping pace with sea level. And this also has a really applied aspect in that the vertical accretion rates that we're developing um, through this work, we're going to be um, uh, providing to DNR. And those can be used to inform future iterations of the SLAM modeling, which is used to um, uh, provide guidance on coastal planning and hazards. Um, so those are, those are the two projects that we're working on right now. And um, yeah, looking forward to talking more about it and answering questions later. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I think now we'll go and move on to um, Dr. Uh, Lizzie King. Uh, and um, again, I think some people mentioned the chat, but if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to put, put it in the Q&A or if you have a chat question, you can put it in the chat as well. Um, and we'll go and uh, let Dr. King take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. And thanks to all the organizers. This has been fantastic. Uh, so I'm Lizzie King. I'm an associate professor at the University of Georgia, and I'm jointly appointed between the Odom School of Ecology and the Wernell School of Forestry and Natural Resources. And my research and practice deals with plant community ecology and restoration ecology, but also social ecological systems and human nature relationships. I'm particularly interested in pluralism in environmental stewardship strategies. So most of my career has been working on those things in East African drylands, uh, which are really different from maritime live oak forests. Uh, but since I've been on the Georgia coast, my lab has been looking at these things in the context of maritime live oak forests on the coast. Uh, so this work started as managers of several barrier islands who were expressing concerns about live oak regeneration. Uh, they weren't seeing many seedlings and they were seeing lots of deer herbivory. Uh, so our research wanted to address their questions of, are the live oak forests imperiled by this lack of regeneration? And if so, what, what should we do? Uh, and when we look at those questions, it's worth noting that the first one uh, is a question of ecological knowledge. Uh, what are the consequences of seedling um, limitation from herbivory? And the other is a question of values. Uh, what, what should we do depends on what your objectives as a manager or steward are. Uh, so so um, the research and the talk that I presented um, 
is, is guided by those questions, but it, it turns out that uh, uncertainty was a major challenge. Uh, we, um, we don't know very much about um, uh, maritime live oak forest regeneration dynamics, successional patterns. Um, and uh, it also turns out that as we talk to people, uh, we notice that coastal stewards all support conservation, um, but they have really different visions for what that means. Uh, so in my presentation, instead of focusing on the ecological results of our research, I really focused on how we approach these questions uh, using participatory methods to, uh, to address both questions of what's going on and what should we do. And I argue that the typical model where scientists and academic researchers derive answers and deliver them to stakeholders isn't always going to be the most effective or appropriate. Um, and we use two, two participatory methods, um, participatory action research and structured decision making to, to turn around uh, the, the authority and the sources of information that we were using um, and to instead of say, ask the researchers, what do we know? Uh, we turned it around using uh, workshops and participatory action research to ask the land stewards and other stakeholders what do you know about forest dynamics? What have you seen? Because the greatest wealth of knowledge that we have about how live oak, uh, maritime live oak forest works is held by, by the experiential, scientific, and cultural knowledge of those stewards um, and isn't really published in the ecological literature. Uh, so we wanted to tap that as a major source of the information that we can use to think about what's happening and understand the role of stressors. And then the second method was uh, structured decision making, which is a formal decision making, multi criteria decision making process that also takes into account the different objectives and, um, and sort of uh, approaches to management that our different um, island stewards had. And then look at, okay, well, if these are your goals, how might these different restoration strategies help address them? So uh, in the talk, I explain how we used workshops to implement both of those methods. And the upshot is uh, we don't fully understand uh, regeneration and its long-term um, uh, sort of demographic threat of the lack of seedlings is a problem. But we do know that uh, you can't replace lost canopy trees if you don't have seedlings. So uh, planting live oak seedlings is a reasonable bet hedging strategy. Um, but this type of active inter intervention aligned with some but not all of the coastal stewards um, and their management strategies. So uh, to work with the people who wanted to do active restoration, planting live oaks, we're developing um, a structured decision-making support tool uh, that, that projects the sort of um, expected success rate of seedlings under different restoration conditions, limiting herbivory, um, limiting uh, um, competition and in making light gaps. But again, uh, our, our field research that we've been doing on seedling performance has only yielded a few years of, of data so far. So in that lack of knowledge, again, we turn to experts, um, nurserymen and restorationists who've been working with live oaks to get them to estimate the uh, parameters of our model from what they've seen. Uh, and so that model will be used to then help uh, islands who want to do restoration estimate the costs uh, and the benefits they'll derive from using different restoration methods. So that's uh, that's what we've been working on um, uh, on the coast with this focus on trying to uh, elevate and advocate the knowledge that already exists to make sure that those voices and authorities um, have a role to play in decision making. That's fantastic, Dr. King. I love this research and you know seeing uh, you know, how people interact and kind of the human element of some of our research uh, and different goals across our, our different uh, realms is really, really interesting. And uh, I like to see how it applies itself into uh, different fields too. It seems really, really neat. Um, uh, and then wrapping up, we have uh, Dr. Asla Aslan from uh, Georgia Southern uh, to finish this up. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing this talk again as well. This would be great. Uh, take it away, Dr. Hazen. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all the organizers for this fantastic symposium. It's been really helpful and um, informative for me as well. 
Um, so my name is Aslu Aslan. Uh, I'm an associate professor of environmental health sciences at Georgia Southern University. Uh, my research is at the intersection of public health, ecology, and engineering. Um, my training is on environmental microbiology. Um, most of my research has been about looking at how water is impacted by human activities and that how that impacts ecosystem and human health. Um, in my research, I use mostly um, rapid detection methods to test water quality. Um, this project that we were funded by the um, Coastal Incentive Grants by the DNR was also looking at um, the feasibility of using a rapid method that, that's been established by US EPA, uh, which is a QPCR method, whether this method can be applied in our Georgia coastal waters, particularly at our beach monitoring. Um, the reason why we're trying to look, look at rapid technologies is that the current methodologies that we have been using since 1970s um, are mostly based on culture-based methods where when a routine monitoring has to be done, um, these culture-based methods can be a little bit late in terms of reporting. Therefore, the applications might sometimes be not as feasible in terms of uh, informing public. So EPA came, came up with these much faster technologies and methods uh, to, to be able to inform public on the same day of sample collection, especially at the beaches. A couple of states have already implemented these methodologies for their routine beach monitoring, and we're partnering with DNR to see if that's going to be also uh, be a possibility in the future as well. So um, in my presentation, I briefly talk about that. Because this is a chemical and enzymatic method, um, there are some caveats to this method, especially for our Georgia waters where there's a lot of organic activities and you know, river inputs are um, occurring at the coast, those may interact with the um, method itself. So EPA suggests that before even adapting such methods, there has to be a feasibility uh, study. And that's what our study is about. We're looking at 16 different beaches that are heavily used across Georgia coast to see if this method can actually be implemented. Um, QPCR has also other benefits once it's established that can be used for identifying sources of pollution by using microbial source tracking methods or um, can be adaptable for um, outbreak investigations and very pathogen specific detection as well. Um, so the applied part of this research is really has been that fantastic collaboration with DNR um, they have been helping us with sample collection, um, sharing the samples and um, reporting back and forth um, our results to each other. Um, so I see that as a great collaboration between academia and uh, state agency. Um, so we are looking forward to continue that project. With that, I'll just leave it for questions for now. Thank you so much, Dr. Oslin. Um, Actually, I might, might hand the, uh, the first. We have a couple questions in the Q&A session. Um, Kimberly, would you like to take those, kind of giving those to the group? Sure. Thank you all for your summaries and, again, for being part of the panel. Um, so our first question, we're going to start off with a, a big one uh, for Amanda, is, um, is sediment accretion keeping place with sea level rise in Georgia? So um, that is an excellent question. That is one of the things that we're setting out to uh, answer here. Um, and so I think it's a complicated question. There was a paper that came out recently um, by Christine Burns, Merrill Alber, Clark, Alexander, and others um, demonstrating that the Georgia, sea mar uh, Georgia marshes have um, uh, enough elevation that right now they seem to not be 
too threatened by sea level rise, but vertical accretion rates are slower than, um, than we're measuring at the Fort Pulaski uh, NOAA gauge. And so our work will add um, uh, more data to that across a greater spatial extent. And so we'll have a bit better, um, a more comprehensive uh, idea of what vertical accretion rates are along the Georgia coast and across these different disturbance gradients. So more to come. And I will say as well, if we address a question to a particular pan panelist, please, anyone else feel free to, to jump in with, with thoughts. Uh, Asli, our next question is, can you speak to how your improved methods could be useful in the context of the new oyster aquaculture efforts in the state? That's a great question. Um, the, the flexibility of this method can help us also detect the sources of pollution. So right now, the way we decide if water is swimmable, fishable, we only look at fecal indicator bacteria, most of the time enterococci for marine beaches. Now, enterococci can actually come from both human or non-human sources. And these are not necessarily always related to human pathogens, therefore the health risk might be different. So using qPCR and molecular source tracking, we can actually look at the sources of pollution that these oysters are being grown, whether the pollution is actually coming from a septic leak or wastewater discharge, illegal anything, that may be impacting those oyster growing areas or shellfish growing culture, um, aquaculture facilities. Um, and because the, the time between collecting the sample, arriving at the lab and after that analyzing, it takes about four hours after arriving at the lab, you can actually um, report the results same day so that actions can be taken same day. And that's such a fantastic advantage if we have a spill or um, an acute event that we need to quickly remedy. Lizzie, this next question is for you. Um, using uh, participatory strategy sounds really interesting and can broaden research knowledge. Are there studies of how this method actually makes stewards better resources for scientists over time? For example, because stewards are being asked for information, they become more observant. And so through the years of using this method, their observations become more sophisticated. That, that's a great question and a great observation that there's, that there's a feedback uh, between you know, uh, researchers putting the question to participants who, um, who become collaborators and the improvement of it. And some of the you asked if there were studies showing that. Yeah, and some of the best uh, examples where people sort of really looked at the methods to summarize that uh, have been done by research teams in, in Southern Africa. Um, uh, Mark Reed and Ian Fazy have written several articles that sort of show how participatory methods change the outcomes for participants, both in terms of uh, getting better knowledge bases like you mentioned, but also uh, when people have a greater of uh, their own ownership of the knowledge that's going into decision-making, um, the, the practice of then following through on management can also improve. Um, that that legitimacy of the decisions that are made also influences how people um, cooperate to, to achieve them. And so it's been in, very instrumental in, uh, in situations where you know, people are asked to make compromises. Um, and, and take on losses in order to conserve biodiversity. So um, having your knowledge validated as part of that, especially in human wildlife conflicts in Africa, but, um, but networks all over the United States, and this is part of why citizen science uh, over longer periods of time can get better and better too, is that your citizen scientists become better at, uh, at feeding the process. So that's a great observation. And um, yeah, if you email me, um, 
E.G. King uh, at UGA, I'd be happy to send whoever asked the question um, an article or two that, that um, gives some of those examples. Great, thank you so much for that. I appreciate you pointing out the, the power of ownership and especially when it, it comes to um, an inevitable compromise where we're all parties are making sacrifices. Okay, our next one is also for Dr. Oslin. Can you describe the process that takes place after a feasibility study to reach an approved methodology? Um, and if I could tack on to that, just you know, expanding to, um, to other habitats, and I thought it was interesting that you mentioned the acidity component um, being a factor. So um, how following the feasibility study, how far do you think we can, can take this application? So this is an approved method by the EPA now. Um, there is one for marine waters there is for, for that targets enterococcus and one for uh, fresh waters that targets for E. coli. Um, after the feasibility study, if we see that most of these beaches are uh, available for TPCR um, testing, then it's really up to the states to whether adopt this method because it really comes down to how much initial investment can be made for routine monitoring at these laboratories. Um, the initial setup of qPCR can be a little bit costly compared to culture-based methods, but there are advantages to that, right? So once that initial investment has been done, in addition to these routine monitoring practices, the method is so flexible that it can be used for source tracking. It can be used for emergency response during, you know, floods and storm drain. Um, can be used for pretty much everything. And EPA has has guidelines for um, um, some threshold numbers that relate directly to qPCR numbers to um, acquiring waterborne illnesses. So they can actually take action based on those threshold numbers. So it's really, I think the most next challenge will be funding to be able to set up those labs. I think once that's done with some, um, you know, uh, training that can be done. That's what we did in Michigan back. Um, they have 1600 beaches to monitor routinely. So when I was uh, at Michigan State, that's what we were doing. We were training these uh, state departments. Uh, so to set up their laboratories so that they could um, monitor using these rapid methods. And they have been successfully doing so for several years. Um, right now, what I'm hearing is they're actually right now also using these um, laboratories for testing their wastewater for tracking COVID. So um, using the same technology. So it is very flexible and feasible. But well, we need to first test it. That's what we're doing now. That is fascinating. And are they still able to have that rapid turnaround time with that monitoring extent, or they're just employing more labs? That's what uh, that's what it is. So it needs to be the beaches needs to be close enough to the testing facility. That's why we had to expand the training to local health departments so that they apply for funding, they set up their labs, and we do the training at there. They do their own beach beach testing so that the distance between the beach and the lab is much shorter. And the moment it enters the lab, it takes four hours, so they still can report before noon if they did an early morning sample. Luke? Okay, I'll ask another one. This is uh, addressed to both uh, Dr. Koska and Dr. King. There are some wonderful research efforts that have identified the need for ecotypic sourcing and propagation of coastal native species to assist in successful restoration efforts. 
is there interest in developing a coastal Georgia native plant restoration collaborative with researchers, nurserymen, federal and state agencies, ecologists, botanists, um, so on, to address strategic long-term development for collection, evaluation, selection, and increase release and commercialization, um, such as certified seed production for federal agency restoration and mitigation use. So I, I guess I'll start out and I'll just say, uh, uh, Karen, I, I know the answer is yes. I'm sure Karen knows that because we've talked about it, um, but it does give me a chance to talk about this a little bit. And I wanted to say too that, you know, uh, uh, another meeting with this same group has been the GCRC meeting every year, every other year. And I get a lot out of that meeting as well. And actually this project that we started with, uh, with Heather Josting came out of discussion at that GCRC meeting. Um, and, and so one of the things that we realized is that there's no uh, source of, of plants for restoration in coastal Georgia. There's, at least there's no nursery in coastal Georgia that provides uh, at least salt marsh plants uh, for restoration. And so through conversations with the, uh, with the DNR, CRD, uh, Jan McKinnon in particular, uh, we started working on this. And now we have a CIG grant that'll start. Uh, in the fall, uh, Heather Josting is a PI, I'm a co-PI on that. And so we've started a conversation uh, with nurseries uh, that might be interested in establishing, um, you know, well, well growing uh, salt marsh plants for uh, restoration in Georgia. And so, you know, we've just started this work and, uh, and yet the, uh, the response has been great. Uh, my understanding is that most of the plants that have been used, for example, in the Living Shorelines program, have been used uh, from South Carolina, have been sourced from South Carolina and Laguerre Farms. Uh, I had a really nice conversation with Helen Laguerre, uh, a plant biologist, um, and uh, you know she runs the farm there, and so she's involved in this project. Um, so, you know, the, the partnerships so far that we've developed have been primarily with the with the DNR and the Living Shorelines Working Group. So I'm looking forward to working more with them. Uh, starting conversations with nurseries on uh, on sourcing, um, and then I see that that Karen mentioned two other partners, you know, federal and state agencies, and so on. I've talked to Nature Conservancy about this. Uh, we want to partner with them uh, uh, and and others. So definitely yes. And uh, the initial uh, response has been great uh, about getting this kind of thing going. And I want to talk to Karen more about that. Um, I also learned a lot, and that's where I learned that that plant diseases uh, might be really important to these restoration efforts. Uh, some of the nurseries that I've talked to have said that they have problems, especially with fungal diseases, uh, when they propagate uh, Spartina. Um, and so that got me really interested in trying to identify what those diseases are and if they are also important in the native marsh, uh, in natural marshes. And I, I just add from the more terrestrial side, uh, the answer is also yes. Uh, the 3000 plus seedlings that we used in our experiments on, on these barrier islands, uh, Hannah Morris, big shout out to a PhD student in our group, had to drive them all up from a nursery uh, outside Gainesville, Florida. Um, uh, and and he, that nurseryman had actually offered uh, as part of his contract to come up to Georgia and collect off of the trees on the islands uh, where we were doing the project. But because of these fall hurricanes, we really were not getting the seed abundances um, in the years that we were looking to propagate and plant. Um, and so, you know, when, when we're thinking about live oak trees, I, I, I'm, you know, again, this is one of those values things. We've been asking managers, are you comfortable with having uh, North Florida live oaks um, persisting in our plots. I mean, they're there, they're, they're surviving. Um, so should we rip them out based on, you know, the sort of potential genetic differences and it's a real head scratcher. So I, I think that it's, it's essential as people um, want to restore maritime live oak forests um, and uh, reconfigure some of the ecosystems that have been affected through um, logging and timber production. Um, that we have, we have the plant materials here. So I'd be super excited to see those types of collaborations be able to um, really respond to the needs of, of coastal managers and, and residents who, who want to 
um, plant different trees and making sure they have the best ecologically um, viable and you know things like disease, um, the best material available. Um, it, being proactive about that is at this point is really would be really really smart. So I'm I'm definitely down with trying to promote that. And there's that added conservation value of not having to expend the resources for the transport. And I think some of this can also even go back to that ownership and pride component that they're restoring with, you know, Georgia locals and. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the, especially the maritime live oak forest um, is, is a cultural heritage. Um, it's, it's both biological and cultural heritage um, for all of our coastal residents and, you know, especially for Gullah Geechee descendant and African American communities, um, re rediscovering, reinvigorating, revitalizing connections with these forests um, and positive associations with them, I think is, is really key. And, and a lot of our work from here out is, is focused on seeing what those communities would like to see out of restoration work and a really cool listening project to hear stories uh, from uh, Georgia coast black communities about relationships with trees and ecosystems, which will be another talk for another time. I really look forward to hearing more about that listening project. That's really cool. Luke, I will turn it over to you so that you can ask some questions. Sure thing, thanks Kimberly. Um, and this uh, it comes from Mark Frischer to Dr. Oslin. Um, he was wondering if all the PCR capacity that has been built up for COVID testing could be utilized, hopefully when COVID settles down, uh, for water quality testing purposes in the future. That's a, that's a great point. Yes, absolutely. It's the same instrumentation, same setup, same training. Um, that's actually the, what that happened in Michigan on a reverse way. They started with... Um, water quality testing, but then they, uh, they also started doing COVID monitoring as well. Um, uh, at Michigan, it, it was a good time in back in 2030 because that's when Great Lakes uh, Initiative restoration um, funding came out that helped a lot of local beach managers to set up their laboratories. Um, such an infrastructure grant actually will help doing the same thing here as well. And once it's done, yes, absolutely. Very cool. I'm hoping that all that infrastructure that's been built up um, can be used for lots of different purposes. Um, we have a, another one from an anonymous uh, attendee, and this kind of goes to the entire group. Um, what do the panelists feel are the most critical threats to Georgia's co coastal ecosystems? Um, and I think I'll send it over to Dr. Spivak first. Uh, I want to hear from her and see what she has to say. Sure, no, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's a, a complicated question. Um, so I think in the long term, sea level rise is probably one of the biggest threats. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the Georgia's marshes have a lot of elevation capital. And so we're not seeing um, the consequences right now of slower, potentially slower accretion rates in the marshes compared to um, uh, sea level rise rates that are measured um, by the NOAA tide gauge. But over the long term, you know, that's certainly of concern. And so um, one thing that would be important to consider is the rate that um, particles are coming from the landscape to the marshes. And so our dams and structures like that, preventing the delivery of suspended sediments um, that would contribute to the vertical accretion rates in marshes. The other thing, um, in terms of organic matter burial and that component contributing to vertical accretion is understanding the controls on decomposition. And so will we expect decomposition rates to change as um, saltwater inundation um, moves uh, towards the more freshwater side and there's evidence that you know, we will have faster rates of decomposition, but also in thinking about um, how decomposition will change in the estuary marshes. And so will more inundation slow decomposition and, and facilitate organic matter preservation? So I think those are all open questions. And then the other way that I think sea level rise is really gonna affect the Georgia coast is that you're beyond the marshes, you're gonna have saltwater introduced to, to um, terrestrial areas, right? So this could have big consequences for um, the fertility of agricultural soils. 
Um, it could have big consequences for um, uh, uh, how land is currently being used, the stability of current infrastructure, plans for future in infrastructure. Um, um, so yeah, so I think it's a very, I think sea level rise is likely to have a lots of different and wide ranging effects on marshes and the, and the coast. And I'm sure many of the other panelists have thoughts on on how those effects may propagate as well, or other disturbances. Thanks for feedback. I think my internet is. You and your dogs are frozen. <laughs> yeah, I saw I saw Luke was frozen. Well, I'll I'll chime in here after Amanda. So I very much agree with what with everything Amanda said, and that sea level rise is certainly a really important threat, and and climate change. And I would add to that too, that uh, multiple stressors uh, affecting the, the vegetation in particular. And uh, one thing I wanted to highlight too, um, you know, so drought and, and salinity could be important, for example, have been shown to, to lead to diebacks in the past. Um, and, and also uh, potential microbial pathogens on the vegetation that I was mentioning before. So it's been shown uh, that that uh, that that fungi in particular can attack uh, 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 salt marsh plants, um, and there's evidence that that when those the plants are stressed, that they lose the ability to defend themselves. So if they're stressed from inundation, from sea level rise, uh, and you get anoxia that's associated with the the fact that the the marsh is inundated more often uh, from that. Um, then those stressors, the anoxia, potentially uh, sulfide, which is a phytotoxin, uh, can then combine uh, with microbial uh, uh, pathogens to, to you know, switch a, a microbe from being a commensal to help it from helping the plant to uh, being a pathogen to attacking the plant. So there's some evidence that this uh, may be happening, and this is uh, one thing that we really want to uh, uh, look into. Other thoughts? Um, I agree. It's the um, sea level rise. I think that will be the main issue because it also impacts our water resources at the coast as well. Um, um, the um, um, well water, for example, can be impacted with seawater sea intrusion, that, that aqu aquifer that we're all dependent on for our drinking purposes. Increasing population at the coast, we are, we're seeing that the, um, there's more people living at the coast uh, in the recent years, which means that the infrastructure may not be ready to handle all that, including our wastewater treatment plants, uh, the efficacy of the treatment, increased um, you know, extreme precipitation events that also the wastewater treatment plants that may not handle efficiently when it comes to treatment. That means that all these effluent go to our coastal waters and impact our ecosystem health. So those are the things that I can think of all related to each other. Uh, I, I, I don't have a, a new uh, stressor to add, but uh, just the recognition that what all the other panelists have laid out, you know, constitutes a wicked problem where we have multiple interacting things uh, and there's no uh, clear predictable way of how intervening on any one of them is actually going to cascade through. And the other half of wicked problems is that the stakeholders and the people experiencing the stresses are diverse and have partial and different perspectives on it. So uh, as, as we go towards trying to solve these, I, I think that you know, it's really critical to keep a view on who is getting to express their costs uh, and who isn't getting to express the costs that they're experiencing and how those different things get incorporated into negotiating how we take action. So uh, after we have all of these uh, threats, there's the, the additional challenge of trying to make decisions that can mitigate them or uh, adapt to them in, in ways that are equitable. So um, that, that I think is also a huge knowledge and methodology challenge um, for, for, for protecting coastline as complicated as ours. I think you bring up a good point. That I think you know, we would take all these, the data that are collected from all these different resources. And then I think you're often trying to build like a best management practices 
document for the future. Like, what do you do next? But uh, different folks want to have different goals and different ways to reach those goals. Um, can you, uh, how do you, when you're looking for a path forward in your, in your view, like how do you, how do you see it breaking out? Is it gonna be just multiple different folks trying to do different things, but kind of with the same overarching goal or are you gonna see um, kind of a, a broader kind of uh, mindset kind of change that you'll have to view, have to, have to do? Well, this is you know really on the frontier of what what people in decision science work on, and I've become really interested in this thing. I didn't know it was called that till I got to UGA and started working with decision scientists. Um, but the different the different methodologies and approaches all do you know they they have their contextual dependence. Like structured decision making um, can be used where where people have very um, adversarial. Um, feelings towards one another, but you need buy-in to sort of take uh, some scientific data to help evaluate it. And that's that's not even a practical starting point in a lot of situations. So I, I think that um, bringing in more social scientists and some of these bigger research hubs, um, like the COPE program, NSF with communities, um, coastal people, um, give a chance to try and figure out some of these bigger scale questions of how, how do we go about trying to do the, um, the implementation side of things, the action side of things um, uh, to, to make sure that, that our research is, is really reaching audiences in, in an effective and equitable way. So I think that there's a lot of room to bring in social science, decision science, and a lot of um, experimental uh, action-based research where we're trying different things and we're being really reflective on what it's achieving. And, um, you know, as we heard from our uh, Jedi panels, that takes a lot of humility and, and patience. Um, and it's not always rewarded in the academic structure. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that that's where some of those answers are gonna come from. Good points. I, I think it, it, we'll have to see how those um, things go. And, and I'm really inter interested to do more research into decision science and seeing how that works out. Because I think that would really help uh, a lot when you're making public health decisions or environmental decisions, especially towards restoration here on the coast. Um, we have some other good questions here in the chat. Uh, Mark Frischer has asked another one. Um, don't forget threats to current political threat, political threats to important regulations to protections that are in place. And I think that's something a lot of researchers and policymakers deal with. Uh, you know, uh, From year to year, priorities can be shifted dramatically. Um, both for funding and priorities. So uh, I wonder if anybody could speak on that topic. I think it's uh, something that affects us all. I'm not gonna touch that. <laughs> it's a hot it's a hot topic uh, of both, of, of, maybe it's a hot stove kind of topic where you don't wanna touch that one. Um, too close to Atlanta, Joel. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> yeah. it's, this is the thing. I mean, it is hard to balance the voices. Um, it's really, really hard to balance the voices. And um, it would suggest that, you know, maybe there, there need to be ways to keep certain conversations going, um, you know, regardless of whether they're at the front of what's um, politically um, palatable at the moment. Uh, but, you know, there are, I don't know, uh, that's a really great question. Uh, <laughs> I think it's one we, we deal with a lot, especially in the public sector here. Um, uh, we'll, um, we only have a, about five minutes left, so we'll move along right to our questions and go quickly. Uh, Kimberly Robertson uh, has a question for Osla. Um, she wanted to know if she can if she can address the potential intersections of, of qPCR and COVID nineteen detection as it relates to water quality. Uh, can we use these water Can we use water quality to project project the next hot spots of C nineteen? Um, are there other potential future human health concerns that we can use with this? Great question, Kimberly. So um, wastewater surveillance has been out there for a couple of years already before COVID started. So there have been a lot of research going on. If we can monitor our wastewater going into our coastal waters, can we see some of these viruses or especially viruses and other pathogens um, at the uh, coastal area and identify our hotspots. So that has been uh, ongoing. 
with the COVID particularly itself, the recent research on that is showing that with the um, treatment techniques, there is really not a huge risk at the environment from the COVID itself into the coastal areas. But the other things that can be um, looked at, and we have been doing that a lot in especially the Taibu region in the last couple of years is looking at the wastewater effluents and how antibiotic resistance is entering our coastal ecosystems. And we see that especially um, when there is um, chlorine treatment, then um, they have the similar um, mechanisms uh, for bacteria that potentially also, when, when a bacterium is uh, resistant to chlorine treatment, for example, they are also resistant to antibiotics most of the time. So they actually may escape from these wastewaters and go into the coastal regions. So yeah, wastewater surveillance has tremendous opportunities. Fantastic. I, I look, yeah, I look really forward to the future of that technology and how it gets uh, used in the broader sphere. Um, we have one more, uh, more, more or less a comment from Marshall. Um, he says, uh, great discussion. Thanks. I appreciate that. Um, I would all, he would also add that the sea level rise may also affect the balance of carbon uptake by marshes versus carbon export to the shelf, a net effect that may have global implications. Uh, I don't know if Joel or uh, Amanda, would you like to uh, take one, take this one? All right, I absolutely agree with Marshall. You, um, the, we know very little about export of carbon, both um, dissolved and particulate and inorganic and organic from our coastal system, or from our wetlands and out to the, the coastal ocean. And we don't know how much that's going to change with uh, sea level rise and uh, warming and, and multiple stressors as we've been talking about. So I think it's a really important thing to, to keep in mind and a really active area of research. I'll just concur with Amanda and, and the question. You know, I think it's a really uh, important topic to look into. It looks like uh, Mona has also allowed Marshall to talk. Um, so Marshall, if you'd like to speak a bit on this um, topic, go ahead. You're still muted if you'd like to talk, but. Well, while well, we're uh, waiting, if, if, if uh, Marshall doesn't want to, that's fine. But um, this, is, uh, this is a fantastic topic and it looks like we're just about out of time. Um, I know Katie has one more question. Maybe that will be our wrap up. Um, but she has a lot, she mentions that there's a lot of concern about how sea level and temperature rise will impact emerging contaminants. Uh, with the overwhelming nature of this topic area, where do we focus? Uh, and that is a really good question too. Um, uh, I don't know who'd like to take that one. And I agree, uh, Casey, stay tuned on that one. Uh, I should mention that I think uh, there is a NOAA Sea Grant Water Resources Visioning Team webinar coming up on the contaminants of emerging concern on May 26th. So um, if you look for, look for that or Google that, check that one out as well. Um, I, that I wanted to- I actually might do it. And I have 11 o'clock on, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Kimberly, go ahead and say something. Sorry, look, you were uh, kind of breaking up. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I just wanted to thank all the, the panelists, not only for coming today and contributing wonderfully to this symposium, but just all the amazing work that you're doing and very grateful to, um, to have you as part of our colleagues with this program and um, to have you in Georgia working on all these important issues. And, um, and we have a, a whole career in the rest of our lifetime to keep talking about this stuff and figuring it out. So thank you so much for your investment in today. I just want to echo my thanks uh, to all the panelists. Uh, thank you again. We learned a lot. This was, uh, you gave us many things to think about. Uh, and thank you, Luke and Kimberly for moderating this session.